uh, I suppose we'll find out, um, but um, uh, there's, there's sort of, it's a bit first world problem this, but, or first world positive, I should say. And, 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 in, and in context of what we, we spoke about last night, um, this really, you know, let's put it into context because people are having very different experiences of all of this. Um, I sit in a corner of an office where I don't get to see a huge number of people. And I have to say that in the course of all of the, the past sort of week or so, um, I probably had more engagement with colleagues having to force them to do it face to face and all the rest of it than um, I might have had uh, on an ordinary time. And, and, and forcing the, the video conference side of things is quite important. Um, definitely seeing more people, definitely having more contact. So um, you're, you're engaging with people more than you did when you were sitting in an office? Yeah, and, and that includes that includes clients. Um, I mean, video calls, I think, have really come uh, come into their own. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, normally I think we'd all hate to do video calls. And when they first came out, we never really wanted to think about it. But but in, in this kind of situation, I think it's, it's definitely the case. OK, thank you very much, Ollie. Thanks for volunteering. And another another person, I'm just going to go to Chloe, because Chloe Martin, because you're at the top of my, uh, of my list. Chloe, what's your thought on this? Wait, hold on. Unmuting now. Hello, uh, Chloe? Uh, sorry, it's Jen Brister. I'm just using my girlfriend's account because I Oh, couldn't... hello, Jen. Hi. Jen. Hi. Actually, <laughs> so, hi, Jen. Hi. Hi. Yeah, lovely hi. to speak to you. Actually, Jen, you're one of the people I've spoken to in advance. You're sort of one of our invited guests. You're a, you're a comedian and a, a writer. You explain to me that you have had the virus so you that's right isn't it yeah i'm literally been... this is the first day of me feeling like a human again for, for about the last 12 days i've been very unwell so you've been two weeks inside even before everyone else was told they had to stay inside yes i was inside You're an expert staying inside <laughs> <laughs> yeah I feel, yeah i feel like i'm uh, i've uh, definitely uh, had a little bit longer um a bit more experienced at it um I um, have, this has been quite a revelation for me because I, I, I don't enjoy phone calls um, at all. I don't, really don't. It's often when people call me, I'll just miss the call and I've really sought out people and I've actually really enjoyed a video call a lot. I've been you said it. you were a natural self-isolator to me oh, on the phone. 100%. <laughs> yeah, I, I, love, I love spending time alone. As a stand-up comedian, I spend a lot of time by myself on the road in hotels on my own, and I um, actively seek that out. I don't, even if I'm in a town where I've got friends, I probably don't contact them. So this enforced isolation has actually, in many ways, made me feel a lot more sociable, and I've actively sought out um, connections, and, and sometimes with people I haven't seen or spoken to for a long time. So it's had quite an interesting. Um, effect on the way I approach um, a lot of my friendships really and I've definitely made an effort to talk to people that I know who are self-isolating and, and they you know they're single or they haven't got any family with them and they're alone all day all night mm. um, and we've been having chats that have gone on for like 30 40 minutes an hour and that's before would have been just god yeah. awful no thanks so <laughs> So I've actually quite, I know it sounds odd, but I, I in a way, I've, I've found myself getting a lot closer to um, members of my family and friends in a way that perhaps I sort of taken their, their connection for granted previously. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jen. I'd, lo I'd love now to go to um, one, of, one of our other invited guests. Um, I'm sure lots of you will recognise her face uh, as long as we can get her up. It's es es Esther Ransom there. Hello, Esther. Can you hear me? Oh, hang on. We can't hear you. I don't think is other, other people also struggling to hear. Hang on. Not hearing. Um, okay. I think we'll have to come back to Esther. I'll have to come back to Esther um, uh, for a moment. And, and instead, if it's possible, um, I'd like to go to, well, actually, let me go to Sky, who's had her hand up for a while. Hello, Sky. Hi, Sky. I think we can hear you. Hi, hi. Hi. Yes, we're not both Sky. <laughs> <laughs> who, 
who's Sky and who's who's I'm Sky and this is my mom Elaine. Uh, we, I, yeah. I, I included her, but I thought we're both here. We can't go in separate rooms and do it separately. Uh, and and what? Wh which way did you two vote on the on the whole? Can you the have better? So I said it's definitely possible, potentially better, and Mom said no. Interesting. <laughs> it, uh, and is that a generational thing because you've been so used to having it? How, how old are you, Sky? I'm 25. Mom's okay. 62, so bit of a gap, yeah. Bit of a gap. And Sky's mother, what's your name? Oh, Elaine. 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 Sky and Elaine. <laughs> Elaine, you, you say definitely not. I, I just, I'm a complete pig. In person, people, person, talk to everybody in every situation in my yeah. life. And I, I like to limit communication mm -hmm. on devices. I find it in, uh, a little inhuman to me. Okay, uh, so it's two we're inhuman. Both actors, so I think that, that's we're both a actors, part of so what we're we people, do. people, so we. Are you living together currently? Yeah. We currently. So <laughs> Elaine, Elaine, yeah. if you, are you in contact with other relations, you know, like this or not? A little, yeah, a little. And you find it's no substitute and it's not happening more. Because I would say I'm calling my own mother much more than I would normally. Mm. Mm. I think if I was on my own, mm. then we'd be talking every day. Or when yeah. she's working away or I'm working away, this is a way we communicate because we miss each other. But um, I, no, I don't think I'm speaking any more than I was. But mm. that's because we, we've I'm got company. Lot we're lucky yeah. we're not we've got company. Either. That's, that's the company. difference. Yeah. That's why I wanted to go to Esther Ransom because, you know, she obviously runs... Child line and uh, the silver line. I don't know if we can try her again. If we can't, we'll try someone else. Let's try Esther. Are you there? Can we try Esther again? No, still no, still not. I don't know if what we can do about that. I wonder if one of my colleagues might be able to give her a call. Let, let me, um, oh, wait. Oh, now we can hear you. There you are. There you are, Esther. I'm delighted. I'm so happy to hear your voice. Um, <laughs> A lot of people there were talking about, you know, loneliness and, you know, it's okay and I'm seeing people more than I did before. Uh, there was a mother-daughter couple there who said they got each other. You were, you know, on behalf of Childline and the Silver Line, which uh, you started up for, you know, uh, older people who are, who are alone. Can, can you tell me, do, do you think, uh, you know, phone contact, visual contact, is, it can, be, it can ever be a substitute for face-to-face? Okay, well, let's distinguish between phone contact and visual contact because both Childline and the Silver Line are not visual. Um, Childline now is uh, young people get in touch with Childline online uh, by email and on the phone. And what all those media have in common is that you can be anonymous if you like and no one can see you. And that means no one can judge you. And that means for a lot of young people who feel that nobody in the world cares about them, they have a very special relationship with Childline. And I have met young adults who've used Childline all their lives to, every time they hit a glitch, they hit a problem in their lives, they know that the Childline counsellors care about them, even if they don't talk to the same person each time. Similarly, with the Silver Line, that is by phone. Um, older people, the vast majority of whom are not having a conversation with anyone else, get into a relationship, perhaps with civil line counselors, perhaps with other callers because we do conference calls and so on. Mm. And they really do feel somebody cares about them. They really do feel less lonely. But when we said to one of our silver circles, we called them, would you like photographs of each other? They said absolutely they would, but of themselves when young. Yeah. Because again, once again, they feel that the, the safety and anonymity of not being looked at means that they're not being judged. When it comes to actual visual calls, um, which I have through Skype, through FaceTime, and never before by Zoom. Uh, <laughs> And never again. No, I'm not saying that. But um, I find it quite agonizing actually, because for me it underscores distance. So the fact that I'm now self isolating and I can't have a cuddle with my grandchildren, even though they're reading to me bedtime stories, which I greatly enjoy, um, it's actually. <laughs> and I like the fact it's around. Absolutely. There's a wonderful new charity 
tried to launch just before the virus called Silver Stories, in which children do just that. The new readers read to older people on their own, and both sides love it. But, you know, I do find it quite painful because what it does is it emphasizes the fact that we aren't with each other. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Esther, I just want to say you're getting a lot, because I know you're new to Zoom, I just want to tell you you're getting a lot of love from the, the chat bit of Zoom. Everyone's saying it's so calming to see from you and hear from you again, and it's like being with an old friend. So I just, I just wanted, to, I wanted to tell you, someone else is uh, very, very cool. Um, I just, could I just go to a couple of people? Sorry, carry on, Esther. I was just wondering if you could say that losing the word old <laughs> just seeing a friend again a good friend a reliable friend <laughs> um uh i'd just like to go to a couple of people in in the chat uh so, so some people are saying that they are you know enjoying being at home now they they're seeing much more interactivity not just n not just on you know face to face jessica heel but saying i've seen playing games having a drink or watching and listening to music it, it makes me think that we all need social lubricants of sorts something to make the interaction more meaningful and deeper through a shared experience we are mimicking our offline behaviors i thought that that was uh quite interesting and um uh, i i might like to go to uh my colleague uh liz if she's around um Liz, you, you're, she's, this is my colleague Liz, she's, uh, she's on the chat, but she's having her own uh, relationship issues right now. Uh, uh, would you just explain to everyone what it is? So I'm um, recently divorced and I don't live with my children. They live with their dad. And um, although just because I, I didn't think it was stressful enough, the coronavirus, so I moved house on Monday um, from London out to Oxfordshire so that I could be based closer to where they are. Um, but obviously, um, it, although the government did clarify the day after the lockdown that if you are co-parenting um, but not cohabiting, that you are allowed to move your children from one location to the next, um, all, albeit at a minimal amount. So you can't be backwards and forwards the whole time. Um, I can't have my children to stay the night with me here um, because the house is new and it's not set up and all the rest of it. So I have to just visit them for the day and then stay in the house where my ex-husband is. And it's and, and as it happens, it, it's fine. We have a good and functioning, you know, cordial, communicative relationship. Um, but I can imagine that if I had had a more acrimonious uh, separation that whole scenario is a total nightmare and there will be i'm sure children and families that are, are are not sort of coping and are just not seeing a parent at all because if you can't negotiate your way around new circumstances and you're dependent on a court order that is very strict and hasn't allowed for this um it's just a nightmare um especially if there are other partners other children you know the whole thing and even if you know my kids are now 20 minutes down the road from me which is brilliant if i'd stayed in london which had it been, you know, two days later, the date of my move, the government, I think, have said that they don't qualify a house move as essential travel. They expect you to get on the phone to your solicitors and call it all off or pause it. That really is a nightmare then, because I would be facing however long this goes on for, just not seeing them at all. Um, so I think it's... Walker in the chats are saying, Michael Gove sounded like he was making it up as he went along as he was talking about this issue on today, yesterday. Just to briefly go back to Esther. I can't imagine that of Michael Gove. He would never do that. <laughs> Uh, Esther, um, just back to you. Have you seen a spike in calls to Childline and the Silver Line since the coronavirus has started? Just, oh no, we're going to have the sound issue again. Hang on. It's happened again. It's happened again. And I'm going to, um, wait. <laughs> I can see, I can tell you can hear me, but I can't hear you. Um, so uh, I'm during this time, I'm going to uh, go to one of our other invited guests. Is Laura there? Laura Henry. Hi, Laura. You, so you're you're a writer, and uh, you've written about intergenerational relationships. And we had a chat this morning about how the situation was affecting you. And actually. You had a really interesting story, if I might say, about, about your son, who's uh, 26 
uh, he's autistic and lives semi-independently, you said. And again, I was thinking about, you know, how does one handle relationships in, you know, of someone who really needs a routine, really needs sort of regularity. Uh, you said even going to the supermarket and not being able to find the things on the shelves that he expects them to has been such a, a big issue for them. How are, how are you and your ex-husband coping with that? Um, again, just wanted to come in and Liz, I can, you know, I, I emphasize with everything that you were saying about your situation with your family. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I've been divorced now um, 12 years, I have to remember, counting on my fingers. And um, my son is 26. The last first year, he, two years ago, he moved out firstly into semi-independent, where he shared a house with three other adults who were on the spectrum but there was always um somebody in the house with them so the last six months he has actually lived by himself with a support worker going in and out um he has found it quite challenging because two weeks ago when everybody was clearing out the shelves of toilet rolls etc he was calling me in the supermarket screenshotting the shelf saying for instance on aisle six there's no toilet paper so therefore I had to go out and find some bits and bobs for him. I've been batch cooking um, and then my ex-husband comes along because we all live about 10 minutes away from each other. So that's very useful to bring um, my son some food. So I think there is very challenges and I don't think there is a lot spoken about. We hear a lot of support for how we're supporting the elderly, the nurses, etc. But I think for adults who have a disability much more learning disability we need to be having some more conversations around how we're actually supporting them and one of the things that I've said to his social worker by email and the support workers is thank goodness myself and my husband live quite locally I'm actually quite concerned about other adults um, who are on the spectrum or who have a learning disability or who are actually quite vulnerable what support are they getting because overnight you know, there's sparks flying off um, laptops, computers to bring in policies, lockdown policies, procedures to support many different people within our communities. And you told me you were doing one specific thing to support him, which I, which I thought was lovely. It's batch cooking. Is that right? Yeah. So basically that's what I'm doing. So I had my annual visit to the shop. This is the first time I left my house to, today to go and do some shopping for, um, lots of different bits of food. There were some bits in the supermarket. And then on Saturday, again, I'll start again with the batch cooking. My ex-husband will come along and drop the food um, over to, to Ryan. So at least he's got something for at least three to four days. But you know, he's quite sensible. He went out himself on Monday and got a few snacks, but I think the added pressure for him, he doesn't need, because I've said to him also to you, you can go out, Ryan, you know, have your daily exercise. And he's saying, but I can't. <laughs> Um, I said, you know, you can go out for a jog with your dad. And he said, no, but we've been told that because, again, he's very much, it's black and white. He doesn't, you know, fully understand it. And it is quite, um, you know, I feel quite helpless within that as his mother and trying to support him. So I think I would like to have more conversations around that, how we're supporting our adults with um, different disabilities and our vulnerable adults. And I, I, I do think... Uh... To, uh, you know, having a meaningful relationship from afar and dropping off batch cooked home food is a really, is a, re is a really lovely thought and something yeah, I, absolutely. even without a sort of, you know, autistic relation is a lovely thing you could do for someone right now, I think. Um, I, I just want to say to your point that there is, um, there's someone else in the comments who's piped up, you know, uh, Tobin, who's saying, we, you know, we are dealing with that as well. Our son is 28 now, he's independent living, but has needed to move home with us. Uh, because of this, uh, you know, for quarantine issues and lockdown and his ability to do everyday things. So for some people, it, it's just not possible to have these relationships from afar. I'd, I'd like, there are a couple of people who've had their hands up for a while. Uh, Fabrizio, hello Fabrizio. Hello Fabrizio. Can we hear you? Yeah, I think you can. I've, I've taken myself off mute. Hello so. Fabrizio. Uh. Um, What's your, what's your thought on all this? So what I found, I'm using Zoom quite a lot um, for my work and communicating with my team and other people. And I found that it can kind of increase intimacy in a way that you can strip things 
out of the way, which would normally be there, like formalities. And because we're talking to people in their homes and the kids are coming in or the dog or we see people without their makeup on, that's been a really nice thing. They're able to come into things without feeling that they need to dress. And I think that's, that's a really lovely thing that we've been able to see people feel more relaxed. I agree with you that, that you know, seeing people's kids wander into the, to the sort of background of a, of a meeting or, or a dog, it adds a sort of human, as one of my other colleagues, Katie, who's probably here somewhere, said, I think we're going to learn a lot about each other in, in, in the next couple of, a couple of weeks. And I, I think that that's definitely true. I, I sympathise with that. Um, Emily, you've got your hand up. I'm going to come to you in just a second. But before I do, I'd love to come to Simon Settle. Uh, Simon, are you here? Because I've been seeing you in the chat talking about how you set up a virtual pub. Tell us about your virtual pub. Hello, Simon. Uh, so this was just um, when everybody was then working from home and self-isolating and it was about um, missing that sort of feeling that it was the weekend. Um, <laughs> everything see it feels like that time between Christmas and New Year where you don't know what day it is because every day is the same. I'm sort of getting up, exercising, working, going out on my mountain bike at lunchtime working eating dinner and then exercising and going to bed and um um everybody was sort of saying oh you know it'd be nice to meet up for a drink so it's very easy with zoom or um you know skype or facetime or whatever you use uh to set up a pub and um you got is it called the settle arms no it has an offensive name so i can't tell you what it's called <laughs> But um, Before the uh, it, it's um, it, yeah, we, we opened at half past seven, and uh, last night I did a pub quiz, and um, it was funny. Um, and you only need like an hour of catching up, and everyone was, and and just having, you know, everything feels very serious at the moment. I'm, I'm really sorry. There's a, there's a move in the in the chat. People are saying, "Tell us, tell us." They want to know. <laughs> Their delicate ears will take it. No, no, Liz is saying no. Liz is your sister. <laughs> This is my sister and she's already yeah, saying it's your sister and she's saying yeah. no, absolutely I'll, not. <laughs> I'll be on virtual lockdown as well as actual lockdown and I can't afford that right now. Okay, okay. So we won't we won't push the name of your pub because Liz says not, uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna take her her word as gospel. Instead, I'm gonna ask you something even more personal, which is okay. I know Liz on chat is your sister. Yes. I happen to know that um you only just started a relationship yes for lockdown so you are one of these people who is neither sort of with a long-term partner yeah. her, nor single but sort yes. of early stages of a relationship yes how, how do you have a meaningful start of a relationship when uh, you only just met and you kind of like the person but you can't see them yeah it, well it, it's quite difficult so we started seeing each other at right at the very end of January, so very recently, and we'd been dating and uh, liked each other and was having a really good time. And then all of a sudden we couldn't see each other. I live uh, in Ilkley, which is in Wharfdale, just north of Leeds, and uh, Cathy lives in Sheffield. So we live reasonably close together, but not close enough to sort of see each other all the time. So we were planning dates and seeing each other sort of once a week if we could. And um then it's all stopped and we kind of don't know when we'll see each other again so you're grateful that you've got you know um good ways of communicating now um it's very easy to send each other presents uh, Present. online is it, yeah is it that uh, present? yeah um and that's always good um i got a big box of 10 large bags of cadbury's chocolate buttons yesterday <laughs> <laughs> Um, and uh, we're kind of talking a lot about the future, you know, what what can we do after this ends? So I've like got no a no. Like it's speeding up the relationship or slowing it down. I think it feels like um, it's it's speeding up. It, it feels like I de I described it as somebody pressing pause, um, and we are sort of thinking about what's happening at the end, what's going to happen at the end of this. So I've got like a uh, notes on my phone, which is like uh, called a state night planning. <laughs> and it's like planning things to do together when we can see each other again. Um, How long? I think 
think that sounds lovely. Your sister's yeah. very mean. She says she's, she says she's saying in the chat that she's had a lucky escape. <laughs> <laughs> Don't pay attention to her. Um, and someone else. I, I hope she doesn't because she's on here as well. <laughs> <laughs> and she hasn't met my sister yet. <laughs> Sorry. What's her name? Kathy. G Gabby. Kathy. Sorry? Kathy. Kathy, you're going to have to stick your hand up in a second. Oh, wait, she's. <laughs> someone else, Natasha, is talking about someone having a virtual date. Um, uh, or, or a second date was a virtual date. That he sent, she said, her date sent her £15 to buy a bottle of wine, which they drank over a Skype calling. If that's not romance, I don't know what is. I've got to, Kathy, I'm going to come to you in a second. I'm just, I'm going to go to, I've, I've, I'm going to go to Emily first because I feel like her hand must, her virtual hand is straining. And then Kathy, I want to hear your point of view. Uh, oh wait, no, yeah, hello, Are you Emily? Hello, oh no, we've got another sound problem. Can we hear Emily? We're having some, we're having some technical issues tonight. Right, am I unmuted yeah, now? Yeah, Hi, yeah. Hello, yeah, Emily. So, Sorry, hi, thanks, thanks ever so much. It's, so, it's, it's great to hear all of the really, really positive statements. I love how innovative everyone's being about all of this. Um, but this kind of fits in with the thing about relationships, really, is for me personally, I find that physical contact is quite important. Um, I'm lucky enough to live with other people, but um, several years ago I went away on secondment um, and I was staying very far away from everybody that I knew. Um, and after I'd been away for a few weeks, I kind of came back home and spent a weekend back home. And uh, when I walked through the door, my housemate gave me a big hug and I just had this flood of oxytocin. Had literally no idea how much I'd been missing physical contact. And then as soon as I felt it again, it was like, oh, wow, that's amazing. I think that I, my heart really goes out to people who live on their own and don't have that opportunity to just have a hug or to just hold hands with someone. And I think that's one of the things that we'll appreciate the most when all of this blows over. Yeah, I think that's a lovely thought. Um... And hopefully we'll get Esther back on to talk a bit about that. I think I, th I think you're right that we don't know what we're missing. And, you know, I'm lucky I live in a house with other people. But, uh, you know, if you're on your own, uh, it must be in incredibly hard. There seems to be a, 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 an uproar in the chat. We want Kathy in uh, capital letters. So, so we have to go to Kathy. I feel like we're really intruding on your on your on your date and personal life. And yet at the same time, I love it. <laughs> that's, okay. that's okay i just actually just got a message saying can you unmute yourself and i said oh god please no because i i think i do actually have the coronavirus so i'm in bed are you really um, with dirty hair and no makeup the shame and yet and yet we're, we're exposing you to a, a room full of over yeah. people to talk about your how your how your early stage relationship is going yeah i mean this is this is exactly what i had in mind when i thought about you know starting a relationship <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, no, quite seriously though, do you send the chocolate buttons? I did send the chocolate buttons. I didn't. They, they only came in packs of ten. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how have you found the sort of, from your point of view, the the? Uh, have you been going to the virtual, the the smartly named virtual pub? I, I haven't been invited actually. Um, <laughs> but I think I think my um, I think I might be the too too delicate a, a constitution to to go. Actually, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I want to hear what he's like with his mates yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, um, and uh, anything else? Any other advice for the early, the early relationship? Uh, it, the early relationship takers amongst us. Seven, since you are, you know, one of the people experiencing starting a relationship from a distance. Yeah, I have, I have got an ace tip actually. It's um, it's quite a, it's kind of a bit slightly daft one, but um, we have the radio on all the time. It's on the same. This is so lame. Oh my God, this is so lame. Sorry. No, but we not. have um, the radio on on the same station. So oh. we're listening to the same stuff at the same time. I, I think that's not lame. I think that's lovely. And I, yeah. I'm going to write that down as a tip. Um, and, you know, actually from a personal tip, when I have a really good friend who uh, moved to New York at one point, um, and she was sort of my best friend. And what we used to do is just have Skype just going constantly, like yeah. we're in the same room almost. And it didn't matter if you were talking or not talking. You could just work next to each other and weirdly... Yeah. I was living alone then and it did feel like I had company. I could just say, oh my God, can I just tell you this thing? But you didn't have yeah, to. Yeah, actually, yeah. 
I had a friend whose husband had to go and live in Nam Dubai for a while while she was in London and they used to have breakfast together at the weekend via Skype just have it on in the background so they were just kind of pottering around together but virtually so but I would say that that had a meaningfulness uh, to it I'm just going to see if there's someone else thank you Kathy thank you so Pleasure. much for thank you. do that to you I, I apologize but I also like I said I quite enjoyed it um, <laughs> uh, can I can I see if um, someone called Miki Meek? I don't know how to say your name. M E I K E. Are you in the room? Um, uh, you were quoted in a piece that Tortoise ran on relationships in the time of coronavirus. Can't see if you're here, and if you're not, there's someone else. Neil Neil was also here. Neil, can I go to Neil? Can you stick your virtual hand up if you can? Neil, just I'm here. Is that, you, is that you, Neil? Hello. Yes. Hi. Neil, you were also so. I should say that um, tortoises have already run a piece of love in the time of coronavirus. Uh, if you're interested, if you're not a member, I'm just going to use this moment to say, if you're not a member of tortoise, you're interested in becoming a member of tortoise, you enjoy this event, please do download us from the app store. You get a three month um, free trial at the moment, uh, or it's a month. Month. You have a free trial on at the moment. Thirty day, one month free trial at the moment um, and you can read all the pieces and be part of all our thinkings but um, Neil you were quoted in um, in uh, Xavier my colleague Xavier's piece on relationships and you have a particularly interesting story because you are polyamorous is that right yes yeah I have um, I have three partners uh, all of whom are dating different people so I'm ethically non-monogamous as it's sometimes called so yeah that's um, monogamous and yes yeah there's, there's a there's a bunch of different terms for it but yeah it, it's it's difficult because everyone's situation is different uh, and everyone has different needs um and you're basically in terms of the i suppose the emotional labor that's involved um there's three times as much work which is difficult enough when there's not a global pandemic and everyone's struggling with existential anxiety and dread um but it's obviously even more difficult now because there's um you know there's three people that i love and care for and miss that i want to help and protect and i can't you know the, the simple things just as stroking someone's hair is um is missing and that's obviously that's true for people in solo monogamous relationships but yeah it's um i think the difficult thing which i spoke to a little bit with um uh, with xavier for the for the piece is really how you um manage those relationships in terms of contact and normally preference is dictated by diaries or well, not preference but priority i suppose is dictated by diaries but at the moment um all bets are off in that respect so you know you you're not really dealing with diaries um and you said and you said just picking somebody feels like choosing favorites or something if you're picking one person over someone else to see constantly in this time a little bit a little bit yeah um and uh that come will at some point come to a head particularly when there's a discussion to be had around huh, without wanting to sound like a, a movie first contact, you know, um, there will be points at which I suppose in terms of quarantine and, and who's had contact with who at some point, somebody's going to have to say, right, well, I'm going to be seeing this partner now, but because you're, I mean, particularly one of my partners is a, like me is a, you know, self quarantined solo had no contact with anybody else. Um, and so there might come a point where we decide that we want to see each other or we can see each other practically. Um, but yeah. And Sarah, who's it, one of the three commented, you know, that it's oh wait, the, the, one, the, of, one of your, one of your three partners is here and has commented. Yeah. Just purely by coincidence, actually, neither of us knew that we were going to be chatting about this. I, I, I texted Sarah because Sarah's in, in fact, the person who introduced me to Tortoise a, a few months ago. Um, and sort of his, oh, thank his you, partner Sarah. Hello. <laughs> and you know, Sarah's, um, <laughs> Sarah's kind of like, um, uh, very much a, a best friend for me really. And, and, and sort of 
uh, I'm not just saying this because she's here in the call, but you know, in terms of someone whose time and company I miss it is, is right at the, the top there. And, and it's, um, it's difficult, you know, and, uh, you know, and you have one of the, the joys of polyamory really is you have very different relationships with each of your partners. Normally that's kind of the, the joy of it. Um, uh, my relationship with Sarah is the one that would probably be most emotionally valuable to me right now, just in terms of comfort and anxiety. And, um, yeah. Coping yeah, with it. absolutely. Um, actually, so uh, our, one of our speakers, Laura, uh, I'd like to go back to her because I think she has some things to say about how to manage anxiety. Laura, are you there? Oh, hang on. Can we hear you? Can you hear me now? Um, yeah, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because um, basically, as well as the stuff around my children's book and the, the TV show, Jojo and Grand Grand, my day job is I work as an early years consultant across the UK and internationally. So obviously that's been put on hold. So since Monday, been very busy with a lot of um, Zoom calls, telephone calls, etc. But for me, one of the things it's about starting, especially a Zoom call, with around managing our feelings. So rather than going in straight in, um, with an, a long agenda, to be asking everybody how they're feeling, what's going on for them, and thinking about maintaining those connections because a lot of my colleagues have found it quite valuable to drop um to jump on and to have a conversation especially those like myself who are by themselves self-isolating like many of the colleagues who have jumped on today and having those um relations i think my colleague is on here now sue atkins i can see her commenting um how we actually do that and maintain those relationships and equally to as well as my son I have my mother, I live in South London, she lives in West London, she's been naughty, she's been going out on Tuesday, she said she's not going out no more, and, um, and I'm hearing from a lot of colleagues and friends that their elderly parents are, have been going out, um, but my sister actually read her the, the riot act around that, so what I'm doing with my mother, because she doesn't do technology, um, is telephoning her a few times a day I'm one of six and that's how we're trying to maintain it with her because I know from that as well as we have the risk from the coronavirus it's people's mental and emotional health that I think we also too need to be having some conversations because I know many people who suffered from mental health before this and what's going to happen now when they don't have the the human contacts and I can't remember the person who spoke before about having the, the cuddles and about why that's actually important, what I would call that, that touching, mm. the touching and the snuggling and why that's important. Yeah, Emily, yeah. Um, thank, thank you, thanks so much. And I can see that Esther has raised her hand, so we're gonna try again with Esther. Can we hear you? Can we? Oh, no, nearly. Hang on. Perhaps my colleagues can unmute you. No, we're, okay, th I think we're gonna have to try it. Oh wait, no, no, we can, yeah. we can hear you. Start again, thank you so much, Esther. Lovely to hear from you. Lovely to be with you. And um, I'm learning so much as I go along. But um, <laughs> I was once almost recruited by a polygamous Mormon, Mormon but that's a different story. Um, <laughs> it's a story we wanna hear. <laughs> What I was going to say to you is that there's no question that this is already having an impact on the young people who contact Childline. We're, um, we're putting out a report about the fact that children are very, very concerned and this may well lead to um, a spike in mental health issues because we've got a cohort of young people who get in touch with us who are already self-harming and, and intensely um, worried and, and filled with anxiety. So I think that we do need to be aware that children and young people have to be encouraged to talk about their concerns. Quite often they try and protect their families from their worries, but this, this virus is affecting all of us. The odd thing is, of course, that older people who are already in isolation, the, the ones who already have nobody to cuddle, no, nobody to talk to are, I suppose, accustomed to this. Um, but Norm said, really hard. 
yeah, it's really hard. And uh, I was talking to one of our civil line callers who was saying that she'd had a call from her carers company who, who provide carers for her saying that actually there's been such a huge demand for their services that they weren't going to be able to help her this week and that is really frightening mm. and i'm hoping that neighbors friends families will make those phone calls will do that batch cooking will remember because we we don't want older people to suffer as perhaps they have in Spain. I know there was one shocking case where the bodies of older people were found who had been left abandoned. So we've really, really got to ensure that those relationships are built, those links are built for people who are living in isolation. And Esther, just on, on that point, do you think that we will come out of this more aware, uh, uh, you know, of, of, of the numbers of people isolated in this country and the effect on them or, or do you think this might be a sort of transitory moment when you know if when it passes everything will go back to normal because like i said i am i mean you know i i see my mum semi-regularly but i feel like i'm more in touch with her now than i was before partly because i'm worried about her um uh and you know just because i think we're all checking in with people more than we did. Do you think it, it might have a lasting positive effect on society? Yes, let's hope so. Let's, let's hope that we as a species learn from this horrible, frightening experience. I mean, there's no doubt that um, the skies are clearer, that the oceans are cleaner now that factories aren't belching smoke into the atmosphere and we aren't throwing plastic into the water the way we, we did. We're not flying our planes through the sky. We're not driving our cars as much as we used to. And let's hope we are building links so that these wonderful half a million volunteers that have offered their services to the NHS, let's hope they, they stay in relationships with the older people that they're delivering medication and food to. It would be really lovely if we all got into the habit of staying in touch with each other, talking to each other, um, at you know checkouts in supermarkets and so on. I think we've become a very isolated species and it would be great if this virus has taught us a lesson. Absolutely, absolutely. If, if I can, thank you Esther, I'd like to go to Shane, someone in the chat, Shane, and then I'm, I can see Chloe, you've got your hand up, I'll come to you in a second. But just um, because you talked about carers not uh, being able to do their usual care work, Shane, you made quite an interesting point in the chat room about your uh, friend's son who's in prison yeah. what's, what, what's their experience so it, it's uh, a strange one that he's he's been in, in prison now for i think it's, it's about six months and he's he's got around six months to go um but as of last weekend that, that was it she wasn't as as far as she knows she's she's not allowed to see him for the foreseeable future and not not only that they've, they've got no real way of keeping in contact and know how one another are doing so it, it, it seems really quite cruel and unjust that events have, have obviously passed us by but it's um it baffles me that um these these kind of communication methods aren't being set up i know certainly in italy um some non-violent prisoners were certainly allowed out on license during this this sort of time so yeah it's and and there's no way of any of our friends consoling her at the moment so it's um really quite it's, difficult it's a really difficult time making a, a already difficult distance relationship even harder it does seem like prisoners are often hung out to dry in this kind of situation um i said i was going to go to chloe but chloe is in fact jen i now remember that from before hello jen and your nice gallery wall. Yes, yeah, it does look like, uh, yeah, I'm in, the, I'm in our study. Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, continue, um, just to add on to what um, Esther was saying about relationships and the idea of collectivism that I feel for a long time, especially I think my generation brought up under Thatcherism and under the sort of neoliberal politics and capitalism and championing the individual and, you know, looking after oneself and not really looking outwards at the community, that I think that this is, could be a turning point for us as a society to 
form relationships with our neighbours, with our communities, and, and then keep those going. And um, I'm one of the people that has volunteered to, um, uh, for the NHS. I'm waiting to, to hear back, um, hopefully soon, to find out what I can do once I'm hopefully completely over this virus as well. But I, I hope that that will continue and that I will be able to keep that, those, any relationships that I form over the next few weeks or months um, and keep those going. And I, and I think within our road and our street, we've, um, there's a WhatsApp group and we've set that up and there's a couple of elderly people in our street who have contacted us uh, within the WhatsApp group to say uh, one lady who's an um, electricity meter, she'd run out of um, money but couldn't get out to get any money, um, couldn't charge her phone um, because she had no electricity so somebody popped round and helped her and and I just I, I really think that those sort of connections are so important and I would love to think that we as a society not just within our own sort of satellite communities but as a whole as a country could continue those and hopefully that will reflect in the way we value our NHS and the way we value the elderly and the way we value each other. And, and Jen, just out of interest, before this whole thing, that the, the lady, your road, you know, that you, that you talk about the way you've got a WhatsApp group going, presumably that didn't exist before. No. Presumably you didn't know the, the, old la the older lady that you were just talking about, you know, with the, with the phone and the electricity meter problem. Are these all new relationships forming? Yes, they are. Um, and, um, and what a lovely thing that is. It is. It's really good. And um, I, I didn't realise this because my, my, my girlfriend was uh, the, the person that really sort of went in feet first and uh, got me involved. But the, it's done street by street. So every street in our area has a separate WhatsApp group, but there is an overall collective um, that's overseeing all of them uh, to make sure that nobody's left out, uh, which I thought was really um, important. And that was interesting as well to see that happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jen. I won't call you Chloe again. And, uh, <laughs> and not least of all, because we've only got five minutes left. If anyone has anything they want to say, stick your hand up now. Otherwise, uh, I, I might go to my colleague, Kerry, if he's available, because uh, Kerry, are you there? Perhaps you're not there. No, he's not there. Okay. Um, so in which case, I might just use this moment, this sort of last moments uh, of the thinking to say, just in terms of um, uh, some of the things that's going on in the chat, everyone else is saying Nextdoor, uh, the Nextdoor app is, is very good. Um, but equally, uh, other people are talking about the chat, the, the, the clap that's happening, the clap that's happening for the NHS, which is um, uh, at eight o'clock tonight. Lots of people are expected to go out onto their uh, front porches and clap for the NHS. So. Uh, that might be another way that we can all come together that we might not have done before. Um, just in these last few moments of the thinking, it's sort of my responsibility to uh, try and sum up some of the really interesting things that have been said. And um, I'd like to have started by um, uh, talk, asking the question, you know, can these relationships be meaningful or in fact any way better than the ones we've had before. And, and, and the interesting thing is the number of people who, who really think, yes, uh, Ollie, I know you said that this was a, a, a first world problem, but uh, it, it is true that I, I know a lot of us feel that we feel more engaged with colleagues uh, than we have been in the office, just as we said, seeing about their, their, uh, their children wandering in, their pets, their dogs, um, uh, that people feel more natural. You mentioned people not putting on makeup, just being themselves. And, uh, and uh, Jen, you, you said as a natural self-isolator, uh, you enjoyed the video calls and you actively uh, seeking them out in a way that uh, you wouldn't before. In fact, you would run a mile from them, that you feel a lot more sociable because of what's happening. And, you know, as I said, I love your story about with your, uh, with your uh, neighbourhood uh, WhatsApp group. I, you see those anecdotally happening all around the country and it does sort of fill, fill your hearts with joy that Blitz Spirit has become a bit of a, a cliche, but at the same time, you know, when you hear that you're connecting with people on your road and starting new meaningful relationships with people that you've lived with probably for years and never paid any attention to, uh, it, it's, a, it's a lovely thing. I, lo I love the, uh, the mother and daughter, I think it was Sky and Elaine, who were uh, split on um, wh whether it was a good or bad thing. I'd be interested to know, have either of you changed your mind? 
in in the course of the conversation. Uh, <laughs> Elaine, especially, was, I'm looking at you. Yeah, yeah. I was already pretty sold, but um, you, you were sold, Elaine. Well, I prefer to talk to people. I, 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 mm, I, I have great reservations about communicating this way. I just talk to friends who've moved to other parts of the country, mm. like you mentioned a friend in New York. Mm. I have a friend in Sarajevo, I have a friend in France, I have a friend in Australia, best friends who've moved across the world. Mm. So to, for them, it's, it's fantastic. But to people in the UK and, and people in my life here, I just prefer to see them as much as, off, as I possibly mm. can. Well, I mean, you know, obviously you're not, you're not wrong in part. For some people, there is no choice. Liz, uh, my colleague, Liz was talking about, you know, uh, being a separated family, how it's easy for her. They live geographically close together. But for people who split acrimoniously, um, uh, Laura, you made the same point. It must be so incredibly hard to manage those relationships. And Esther talked about how uh, we're seeing, a, a, we'll, we'll anticipate a sort of definite rise in mental health problems among children um, uh, as a result of this. So that's definitely something to watch out for. Um, Laura, I loved uh, how you talked about how your son uh, was coping with all of this and, and how we're learning different ways of supporting people. And uh, batch cooking is one of them. I think it's, it's definitely something we could take home from this as how we can get through this. Um, Fabrizio, you talked about the increase of in intimacy again. And Simon, I love your virtual pub. Uh, I'm sorry it was too offensive. A name to uh, to bring to the table. Obviously, we're all going to be left wondering. Um, uh, the virtual pub with the offensive name is definitely a take home from this. And also, Kathy and Simon allowing us to expose your new relationship to a, a group of a hundred people uh, and ask you how that was going with chocolate buttons and um, listening to the same radio station. Uh, I love that, and it's really it's actually genuinely presence, listening to the same radio station, a really lovely tip about how to share some time with people, synchronised listening. Um, I do take Emily's point that physical contact, that, that real sort of uh, rush you get from a hug with someone you love, there's, there's nothing uh, that, uh, that <laughs> Emily, there you are, uh, that, that, um, that can uh, substitute for that. And uh, uh, Neil, talking about your unique situation, being ethically non-monogamous and having your one of your partners here was really interesting. And Shane, you talking about how difficult it is for your friend whose son is in prison, uh, hearing those sort of different stories about how different people are coping uh, is really in, enlightening. I think um, uh, I would like to end with something that, you know, Esther said, which is really that hopefully we can take something away from this, something really positive uh, about this, that we don't want people to suffer like they did with Spain. And perhaps the legacy of this will be that we can learn from this frightening experience and form better relationships and keep uh, these, these things going and look, at, look after our elderly in a way that we have uh, started to in the last few weeks. So uh, I just want to say thank you everyone, especially to our guest, Esther, Jen, Laura, um, but everyone for uh, talking about this uh, really interesting topic. I've actually genuinely got some good tips from this. So um, thank you very much. And uh, let's keep talking and uh, feel free to stay on in the chat and talk to my colleague, but, um, Liz. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. <laughs>